I was always in love with oysters, even as a kid, because you were surrounded with these beautiful shells, and they always reminded me of, of the peace of nature, of peace of the coast. Beautiful. You have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. You have eight oysters on a mature, big oyster. How beautiful is that? The biodiversity of oyster reefs is uh, very similar and probably when we start studying them even more so, very close like coral reefs in the tropical, subtropical areas. They are really our coral reefs. Globally, it's said that 85% of oyster reefs are gone and are not functional anymore. When you look at shellfish, you're really looking at the history of, in some sense, of New England and how these laws and regulations evolved. In many cases, you know, how we manage this particular resource goes back a lot of years. State by state, there's an intent to be cooperative with this type of work, but oftentimes there are a lot of rules and the rules get confusing, complicated, or conflicting. Recently, we started understanding that we lost oyster habitats and oyster population. And uh, that's what, you know, this whole understanding what used to be here and where are we now is very important in order to persuade and teach and educate local communities and uh, policy and regulations to restore not just uh, oysters for human harvest and uh, seafood, but also to understand what their ecological function really is. Oyster reefs are a fabulous habitat um, in any estuarine system or marine system. They're three-dimensional, they have structure, fish love them. There's nooks and crannies everywhere for small marine invertebrates and fish that feed on them for trapping algae, seaweeds. It's a processing facility for, for clearing the water of excess nutrients. Shellfish actually leverage the food that's available for them in the natural environment. They fix nitrogen, the nitrogenous waste that uh, is the fertilizer runoff or manure runoff from farms or from people's lawns or from uh, septic tanks that run off into our estuaries. And then there's algae that grows off of that and the algae can grow so dense that it creates a harmful algal bloom. So it's really the main source of uh, pollution in all of the estuaries in developed countries like the U.S. That risk means that for a long time, uh, you know, decades now, we have been regulated in a way that mandates all of that traceability and also mandates um, quite a bit of detailed handling practices uh, from the point at which the oyster is pulled from the water uh, to the point at which it reaches your plate. The other part of it is what happens in the water uh, while the oyster is growing. And, um, that we do, again, in tandem with our regulators of the Division of Marine Fisheries. They do uh, extensive kind of water testing, uh, monitoring the areas where we're growing the shellfish to make sure that the water is as clean as possible. You're not allowed to grow shellfish uh, that is for the market in any water body that's not uh, ranked in the highest possible rank under the Clean Water Act. Early in the 2000s, the researchers noticed a 
huge spawn event, a big burst in uh, productivity amongst the oyster populations in the bay. And this was totally surprising to everybody there. What people were thinking was that the population wasn't even large enough to sustain the estuary, but here we had an explosion of young oysters in the system. If we made the habitat a little more comfortable for the oysters, if we had more hard bottom so they could, when they, when they spawn, they had a place to set and to, to reproduce, man, we could increase the populations of oysters in this system by tenfold pretty quickly. So that got to the idea about trying to build reefs and reestablish these, these populations. So we're basically working in an area that used to be an oyster reef, but isn't any longer. What we have to do first is put a foundation down that's gonna support the reef, and that's shell. So it settles down a little bit. We try to do it in an area that's firm bottom, but that provides the foundation. And that surface then provides places where oyster spat can settle. It's converting an uninhabitable place to some place that's effectively an oyster nursery. So we actually will acquire uh, oyster larvae. We get oyster shell recycled from restaurants. We wash those shells, we put them in cages, we put those in tanks, we release the larvae in, we adjust the food and some of the temperatures, and we get the larvae to set on those shells. We grow them out a little bit, and then we take those shells and we put those on the reef as well. So there's a foundation and there's a seeding on top of it. We found that through that process, we're able to create a reef with about the same density of live oysters as we see in our native reefs in New Hampshire. So that's sort of the essence of a sustainable system that doesn't need people, that's on its own, that's now becoming part of the functioning ecosystem. One oyster on its own can't have a huge impact in New York Harbor, but if that oyster can motivate 10 people, then that's a really powerful thing. The Billion Oyster Project is a um, long-term plan to restore one billion live oysters into New York Harbor over the next 20 years and to do most of that work with public school students. There's an immediate and dramatic effect on local biodiversity when you put any kind of structure in the bottom. Just a simple wire box with oysters in it. Um, you put it down, you can't see anything. Um, as far as, you don't see any life. And you come back in three months and there's just, it's, the whole thing is covered with living things. In 2011, we started the first ever oyster reef restoration of two acres right here at the Duck Creek in Wellfleet Harbor. Just place a shell in the mucky waters, in the mucky mud, muddy substrate to, to create a hard substrate. And then you have here like a four or five year generation oysters just on one shell. Exponentially, we have 100% of increase of biodiversity. We have so many turtles that come to harvest and feed there every day. I would, there would be between 40 or 50 turtles just in two acres. Policies and regulations are not allowing in most of the states and all over the world to place oysters in the dirty waters. We started our first oyster reef actually in New Jersey. They revoked our permit and we had to throw all of our oysters into a dump. So today we have uh, New York allowing restoration to occur cautiously, but small steps they're allowing like with the Soundview Reef that we're at now. it's like chicken or egg, you know. You cannot place oysters in dirty water, but the water cannot get improved if you don't put native shellfish there. One of the things we're hearing mostly is it needs to come from the municipal level. So the towns can make some decisions and make some recommendations and make some commitments to protecting an area, providing protection against harvest, controls against harming a reef that may be newer in development. Those are the type of opportunities that are going to help get us and the towns and the state on the same page about 
being able to rebuild these reefs for the sake of nature services. I think there's just something that intrinsic about human nature that that is you know values and, and benefits from uh, more abundant natural systems. That shell, we take it to our uh, storage facility over at Save That Stuff in Charlestown. We age it for a year, and then it's used in projects in Ipswich, Wellfleet, Wareham, all around the state. Just to sit down for an hour and clean a cage off and pick up an oyster and hold it in your hand and look at what nature is, is capable of doing connects people in a whole nother way. Nature is an amazing collaborator. They uh, work together to create uh, conditions conducive to life. Solutions are all in us. It all starts with appreciating our environment and nature more than we have been. And we can start with an oyster. <laughs>